welcome. Hello, hello. Thank hello, you. Hello, hello, and uh, welcome uh, again to the Ahimsa Conversations platform. Thank you so much for making time for this live yes. episode. We just rewatched your uh, the snippets episode okay. from your conversation. Um, is there anything that you would like to say first as a kind of as an opening remark before we get into the conversation? And then I'll introduce our friends who are here. Yes. Well, good. Uh, good. It's morning uh, for yes, me. Yes, for you it's morning. Good morning. Yes. I just sent uh, my kids off to school. I have a son that's in high school. Um, he's set, he's just about 17 and my daughter is uh, 14. And it's a heavy day here in the States. Yesterday, uh, there was a school, a, what we call now, we have a word for it, school shooter or a school shooting where a 18 year old went into one of the elementary schools and murdered 19 children, children. Um, we have a huge problem with gun violence in this country, but we also have a huge problem right now in mental health crisis, which is something that isn't talked about enough anywhere in the world. And here where we have, you know, a lot of services, we're not understanding what our children are going through. It's really hard. So my, my, my heart is heavy today and sending the kids off to school. And, um, and it's sad that this is the state of the world that we're in. And I know it's not just here, but so yeah. good morning, good evening. Sorry to yes. start it on that downer, but that's where my, no, that's no, the, no, all of us, that's where my heart thinking. is right now. Yes. Yeah. No. And I mean, though we are very far away physically, I think all of us are thinking of that horrific incident and, and, and it's repetitive nature. I have seen so many statements, you know, since morning uh, by different public figures uh, who are expressing, I think, grief and a sense of desperate helplessness. So um, I think we are all in the same boat, Nisha. We could tell you many stories of things that happen here. But I think today, since we have only half an hour with you, uh, we will, let's focus on your, there's so much that is creative and, you know, forward looking in the work you do. So I'm hoping we can focus on that. Uh, but very quickly, I would like to introduce Akriti Bhatia uh, and Nandini and um, um, uh, Intakav, who are members of a very interesting group here. It's an audiovisual group called Paigam, and they will all say something about themselves in a bit. Um, I just wanted to uh, get things rolling here. And I'll only ask you this one question, and then I'll ask the others to come in. Um, what do we do, Nisha? How are you dealing with this situation today? Because actually that was the first question on my mind also, that there are sometimes situations when dialogue seems impossible. For right. example, with this shooter. Um, so what do we do? How do we still hold on to the the you know the, the the deep value of the importance of dialogue and yet how do we be real uh, yeah. so i'd love to hear thoughts on that please i think that that's you said what is so important in combination is holding on to the value of dialogue and being real in fact real dialogue especially across difference can't happen unless you are real you have to come to the conversation authentically who you are and you can count on me to bring a few things into the conversation. We do a lot of work here across divides. And just like here, as in India, there is toxic polarization that is increasing violence, increasing hatred, and making people believe that there's no way to come back together. But we know that there have been moments in history um, where you can come back together, where you can have a unity of purpose, where this common pain of feeling so divided and, um, and living in fear and hatred, that pain can le lead to common purpose and bring us back together. But I do think it starts with dialogue and it starts with listening, really, truly listening deeply. And it's hard to do sometimes, but if I'm the person committed to dialogue uh, with someone that seems unmovable, 
I have to just, just listen. And, and I have a few tips I can share that I've please been do. practicing please, a lot please lately. Do share. Yeah. Yes. Um, one of the, one of the things I always try to do right now is find a place of agreement, any place of agreement. And an example I use here in this country is a big debate around masks. If you wear a mask or you don't wear a mask at the height of COVID and the two sides could not, it seemed like if you were a, uh, you know, progressive liberal on the left Democrat in this country, you wanted everyone to wear a mask. And if you were conservative Republican on the right, you thought masks were stupid and we shouldn't mandate them and it's nobody's business. And if you said anything, if you said one, you were in this group, one, you were in the other group. Now there's a million problems like this, which are this group, that group, and it doesn't make sense. How did, how did that happen? And so no one could have a dialogue. And I just listened. <clears throat> I happen to have uh, parents on my son's baseball team who have very different politics than I do. And they said, it's really hard to breathe. I don't like to wear it because it's hard to breathe. I can agree with that and not diminish my view that you should still wear them. So I find that place of agreement. You're right. It is hard to breathe. It does suck. Or another parent like, oh, my kid's getting pimples and they're already really insecure. And now they have pimples all over their face from this mask. And it's been a hard year. That, 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 is, that sucks. That's terrible. You're right. That doesn't change who I am and my values that I do think wearing a mask helps protect people, right? I can have a conversation and agree. But right now we feel like if we are talking to someone who has a different idea about a policy, we can't agree with anything they say, even if it's reasonable. And in fact, that's the fight we're having on gun control. Are you actually against having a background check on a gun? Like, why would you not want to know if someone's committed a crime before you sell them a gun? But it's gotten to this point where I am pro-gun, all gun rights, absolutely no regulation. And you have people that are like a ton of a ton of regulation, and all of these people are are absolutely crazy. There's obviously some in between, and so we have to listen for agreement first, and listen for understanding. If you can find the point of agree of agreement and say it, I agree. It opens up an entirely different conversation after that. The dialogue is very. Then they're also looking for a place of agreement. It's unexpected. It's that same. Uh, moral jujitsu that we talk about here. It's unexpected to agree, agree, see what happens afterwards. Um, and you're not lying. You're actually being also more authentic and more truthful and more real. And um, I think that's just one small trick. Listen deeply and find that place of agreement before thinking of anything you want to say. Yeah. And I think also, in a sense, while honoring the pain that <clears throat> all the players in the situation may be experiencing, uh, not letting that pain overwhelm you. Yeah. That is very difficult, I realize. And especially in these, in the situation that you are in this today, you know, your morning in the USA with that uh, tragic incident yesterday, uh, it is very difficult, uh, you know, to, uh, to not feel overwhelmed by the grief and the anxiety. Yeah, As you said, you know, this morning, parents across the U.S. have had to have the courage to send their children to school. And, and actually, in a sense, that shared anxiety also is a common ground. It is a common thread. Yes, if it, sh it only, should be. It, you it, know, yes. yeah. we should be able to hold each other in our pain. I think when you grieve with somebody, you're able to then grow with somebody. And we say that a lot at my organization, common pain can lead to common purpose and common purpose can lead to a common project. And I think there's a common project right now across the world, which is coming together and healing across divides. Cool. Absolutely. Akriti, would you like to come in here with any thoughts, any questions for Nisha? Uh, Akriti is a young activist, Nisha, who is uh, the moving force behind this great audiovisual group. Pagam, who are our partners in doing the live events. Please, Akriti, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Rajni ji. And uh, Nisha, thank you so much for uh, your very enlightening thoughts and also um, deep uh, like um, anxieties that we all share. Thank you for uh, you know uh, highlighting these very important issues. Um, 
uh, just to quickly talk about pegam we uh, are actually a network of scholars and activists and uh, we focus on media advocacy and action research i also teach in delhi university and uh, one question that really uh, i'm not too sure how directly it relates to the recent violence uh, incident that we're talking about but i somewhere feel that you can still deal with uh, individuals who are actually committing crimes and uh, perpetrating hate but how do we actually uh, deal with the structural and systemic issues of violence right so i'm um, something like state repression Yeah. even in your uh, snippets uh, yeah. that that we watched in your previous you also mentioned how false cases were slabbed and you know for activists like us who are, we are, we are trying to deal with such situations how do we hopeful how do we be hopeful in a situation where the entire state apparatus is actually uh, taking up uh, characteristics that are increasingly violent so yes. this is uh, one of the things that is really troubling me and i'm hoping to hear from you on that thank you thanks sir i often i have a my organization here i have 65 staff people and i feel like i often um have to give this answer because some days it is really hard and right now it is very hard to be human the last few weeks the last few months the last few years have been particularly difficult in the increase in state sanctioned violence the increase in um the, you know the different uh, i'd say the the move towards authoritarianism around the globe and it, it's hard to be human and wake up and persevere i am an optimist and i believe the world will change one i've seen it we know the stories that it, that states and governments and the people in those positions does change there is a possibility to reach a tipping point when love and unity do outpace fear and division we've seen it happen in time but i'm not just an optimist because i know it it's um possible i feel optimistic because i myself am determined and i want my entire staff to be determined i want my children to be determined because i firmly believe we create the future everything we do today creates the future and if i am determined to make it better than the past if i am determined to flip the way the state is operating then i know the future is is possible that i'm dreaming of and for us in the us we do a lot of work with our government in terms of passing new laws and bills and legislation to try to change that but i also know it's a long game um when you have corrupt politicians and you have a political system which it is impossible to switch who's in office it becomes a little harder but the human spirit what we work on changes it so i don't know the exact point in which um where you need to apply pressure to flip what's happening there but there are a few and i'm glad that you're in media and media advocacy because i think it's the stories that speak to the heart that change the way people think that type of um cultural shift the belief in who we are as a people and who we can be that's told through media it really is the stories that rise to the top tell us who we are and right now every story getting covered is about division all of the stories you hear are how bad this group is how good this group is how you know that's what's getting covered and that's what's telling us who we are but what i know when i talk to people on the individual basis is that's not who they feel they are they're out of sync with that you see the division you know we're more divided than ever but you also at least the polls here in the us and i believe this to be true in india people are yearning for it to end the majority of people do not want that they're just the quieter ones or they haven't been able to break through in the media or they are scared to say hey I think this is kind of stupid because then they get shamed and put in the other group and uh in some cases killed, ostracized. So we haven't made it possible for people to come out and say, "Hey, I'm part of the middle who thinks there's more nuance to this conversation and wants to see a change." Um or I'm from this side, you know, like I am this side and I believe that this side isn't bad and isn't wrong, right? There's we have to make that possible and i do think that media plays a big role in that and 
I don't know how to, if I knew how to make the good stories catch on, I could change this world. So I would keep experimenting with that, testing it. Um, how do I say this in a way that people start, you know, retweeting and, and sharing and um, which ones are not more infectious and then just keep doing it over and over again. Um, because I do believe there's more people who want to be together than tear us apart. They're just um, being silenced right now or too scared to do something. You're Thank not you so much. Sorry. Yeah. Shut up. No, just wanted to say that uh, I, I mean, that's an experimental, like ongoing thing of seeing how stories are infectious, but definitely Nishaji's uh, optimism is infectious indeed. So thank and, you. <laughs> and in a sense, Nisha, this is exactly what the Pagam team is doing. Um, and yet, I think to just reinforce what Akriti was saying, I think all of us are anxious that uh, the voices of humanism uh, seem less organized than or have less visible impact. Uh, and I think visible is the important word here uh, than the forces of darkness. Yeah. Because as you said, and as Akriti also said, the superstructure seems to support uh, or at least uh, you know, allow the forces of darkness to hold the ground. And, uh, and, and I think, therefore, I, the situation we are in now, uh, and it's not a new situation, I think this uh, has played itself out in many phases of history, is how to keep the faith in the importance of the individual action while struggling to build the collective. Yes. We have uh, an, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, you know, it, it's a really good question. And I've been thinking about change. Um, no matter how many times you tell the story, it's never just one person or one movement or one group. There is an entire ecosystem of people trying to move the country forward. It's a, it is the people who are doing the direct service, um, you know, feeding and housing and doing all of the direct service work that needs to, to happen. That's an important part, as is the activist on the streets, making noise, making sure people can't ignore it, as are the people working on uh, electoral races and changing the politicians, as are the people doing the bridge building work in the dialogue world, work in the media. All of that is one ecosystem. And we often see ourselves as different as our strategy is the best strategy, join our strategy. That's also quite divisive. So I think one, just on our own side, the people working towards good um, have to see ourselves as a very uh, diverse fabric of folks that, are, that actually work together more than we do. And we have to allow people to try the different strategies because I think that also on the side of progress, it is also um, hard to come out, at least here in this country and say, I want to build bridges. One of the biz biggest examples we have is we worked on passing this one law in our Congress that was going to reform the criminal justice system here. We have a very um, a, a very corrupt and problematic uh, prison system here. And we knew to pass this bill in our Congress, we had to have Republicans, the other party on our side. There's no way to get it passed any bill right now in our Congress if you don't have people from the other party. You have to bring them in or it won't pass. But we had people on the left um, really shame us publicly about doing that. Why are you talking to Republicans? They don't, they're coming at it for a different reason. You're just being used. Um, you're gonna let them win. Every type of possible argument stopping us from getting this done from our people, from the people who are part of my social change ecosystem on the side of progress. and. That is very strong too. Don't work with the other side to get something done. No, in fact, it's not just the right thing to do. It's the only thing that works. I am going to have a better piece of legislation. I'm going to have a better idea if I bring in voices who think differently than me. That's been proven, you know, it's proven in nature. It's been proven in history. And I even can tell it to you now where we're trying to work on climate change. And if I were to think, dream of a policy about climate change, just from where I sit, I live in California. So I would talk about fires, 
I would talk about drought. I would talk about electric vehicles. But if I go to the middle of our country and talk to farmers who are on the front lines of climate change, they would have a whole different set of ideas about what to do and how to tackle it. So you have to have that diversity of thought in order to have the greater good. So yeah, as an individual, I can bring an idea to the table, but a collective is actually people I don't even know or people who I perceive to be on the other side are gonna come at that, let, are gonna come uh, to make that law in a very different way. They're gonna put very different things in it. That is a stronger piece of legislation. It's more durable. You know, it won't be overturned or, or changed because you did take the time to listen and bring people together. Sometimes when I hear that, you know, how do we keep the individual conversations and move at the collective? Um, we often think of the collective as only our group of people, the people who look and think and act just like us. And in fact, if you try to extend the collective and make that circle bigger, you yeah. get shamed from your own side. And I know that the people inside prison in this example did not care who I worked with. I have to keep them in mind first. And when I am dead serious about freedom and dignity for everybody, yeah. I will work with absolutely anybody who shares that goal. And that has to be the North Star, or that has to be the thing that keeps us motivated. Who are we doing this for? That collective keeps us motivated. And then we have to have a high tolerance in our individual action to take those risks that might not be popular. Absolutely. So what I'm hearing you say is that purism is dangerous in all contexts. Yes. Because it tends to be, uh, the purist tends to see the world and life in very black and white terms, and that's never reality. Yes. You know, and, and in fact, that is uh, my, my biggest concern with the, uh, you know, in relation to the digital era is that, you know, to some extent, even the technological frame is forcing us to look at the world in binaries. Uh, yeah. It's only in the digital realm, you know, that you are asked to like or dislike. Right. Most of life is made up of something quite different, which is neither like nor dislike. Yeah. No, it's in that vast space in between. Um, in the fact, would you like to come in with any thought, any reflection, any dilemma that you would like to share? Okay. Nandini, are you there still? Nandini, would you like to pose a question or a Nandini, thought? To... Yes, oh, yes. Go ahead, please. Um, uh, Nisha, sorry, Nandini has a little bandwidth issue. So the camera may not be on, but uh, she'll be there. Go ahead, Nandini. So the camera may not be on, but she'll be there. Go ahead, Nandini. Sorry, Nandini, we are not able to hear yeah. you. So my question was about... Sorry, Nandini, we are not able to hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was saying that uh, a lot of young people today, you know, they get hopeless when they see these things um, are keep happening around them. I'm sure that um, you must feel like that too sometimes. I'm sure that uh, things happening around must get to you and must affect you optimism somewhere online how do you then you know bring yourself up and how do you keep doing what you do how do you stay optimistic in spite of all of what is around what is happening around yeah i heard your question is the hopelessness that we're all feeling yeah and how do we move the hopelessness that we're all feeling yeah so you know, I have been struggling with this a lot over the last month. Um, I, you, you can see I smile. I am very optimistic. I walk through life really um, with the attitude that, you know, anything that's wrong, I can fix it. I'm just a fix it person. I have been this way as long as I, I can remember. And so, you know, I realize not everyone's like me. I do carry around that optimism. And a lot of people come to me because they see that I don't feel hopeless. And they come and they say, well, what's the optimistic take on this? What is the better way to look at this situation? And they can usually count on me for that. But the last few months have been hard. I think after two years of living through this pandemic, after seeing the division increase and the violence increase 
And after seeing our families even torn apart or our neighbors uh, torn apart in our neighborhoods and our communities, it is hard. It is hard to stay hopeful. And I think a lot of young people in this country have just decided to ignore it all. If it isn't in their daily life, they're just living their lives and talking about sports or music. Um, it's a coping mechanism. Instead of dealing with the pain and the hopelessness that they see, they are just, you know, focused on something they can control or things that, you know, aren't important. And it's hard to see because it is our young folks we need to change the world. They're the ones that create the future that we're going to live into. And so engaging uh, young folks in all of our conversations in a way that is safe and in a way that really honors their experience is important. My children, uh, I mentioned 17 and 14, they've lived through something at their age I could never even fathom. Myself as a teenager, having all of a sudden two years where we live, they didn't go back to school for um, almost two years. They were at home, very little interaction, and their entire lives just switched overnight. And now they're back at school for almost a year. They're dealing with kids' suicide rates are up, mental health issues. It's heartbreaking. And in fact, the only thing that's the things that are being offered to help them, they don't want. <laughs> and so they're, they're staying out of the fight. Um, it's hard to see. My only take is what I said earlier. If we're determined to create a better future, a better future will come. And if we accept hopelessness, we will get a hopeless situation. And that's, that's the way it's always been. Change comes, but not without a fight. And so we do have to stay in the fight. And I tell my staff on days when I feel hopeless, I actually tell them. I'm the leader. They're used to hearing me really show the path forward and, and tell them what we need to do. But when it's hard, I say it's hard. And just like my kids, when they need to do nothing but talk about sports or play sports, great. I will honor that. Take time off. Let your people take time off. We have to be in this fight for the long term. So if you need a day, a week, a month of rest, take it and then come back and determine to create a better future. And we really do need to love and honor everyone's way of dealing with it, um, especially for young folks. Absolutely. Um, because the, <clears throat> the larger context in which they are struggling with all these realities is actually unprecedented in human history. Yeah. I think there is no other period in human history where change and uh, technological change and its effect on our lives, uh, every day, every moment life, uh, is as profound and unsettling as it is now. Um, you know what you were saying reminded me of uh, uh, an idea that I always throw around. Pessimism is for better times. Pessimism is? For better times. Aha, uh -huh. yes. Yeah. You know, we don't have that luxury. Um, maybe, Nisha, in closing, maybe we could focus a little bit on, because actually you've, you've highlighted it quite a lot, uh, that, you know, many of the things you were saying is what I call practicing nonviolence first upon yourself. Which is all the things that you said, you know, when the going gets too tough and you feel you can't cope, take it easy, step back. You know, all the problems that you think need to be fought will still be there. Yeah. You know, tomorrow and day after, next week, next month. So that is one. And also, I think, Maybe there is a very real need to, in a sense, squeeze every last drop of joy out of whatever there is to be joyous about. Um, I know that this is not an idea that gets discussed uh, in the conventional discourse on nonviolence, uh, but I, I can't help feeling that defiant joy. Mm -hmm. or if not joy at least defiant cheerfulness but not as an act not as a pretense um but i think as, you're right you know i really do joy joy is so important 
And what are we doing this for? Why do we want change? Why do we want progress? It's so we can experience that beauty of humanity, that there are amazing, beautiful, joyful, soulful moments. And those should be always celebrated. They have to be. Because even in the darkest times, the darkest times in human history, that joy, that ability to be human together, that pulls you through. You cannot fight in the most horrific moments without that joy. It actually is is quite important. Also, how are we going to attract people to doing it our way if it looks horrible and miserable and we're horrible, horrible and miserable? You can't be like, oh, my life sucks. I work all the time. Um, and there's no joy in what I do. Join me. That's a bad strategy too. Um, but not as a pretense. I think that there is beauty in, um, in every moment and we have to find it and we have to celebrate it. So definitely celebrate your wins. Um, that's right. That's right. And also, uh, you know, I think uh, I like to keep reminding myself about the physics of the human consciousness. I mean, there is a physics to, you know, human behavior and human emotions. And I think one very major factor in that is that it's very difficult and tiring to sustain hate. It's true. Hate is a very draining and, uh, you know, tiring um, emotion. Uh, So you want to maybe just close on that note by saying a bit about how you have seen this play out in your work, because I know you have a lot of experience with this. Yes, you can't. Hatred isn't for our side. Um, If we try to out hate the people who hate, um, we'll lose. And so part of one strategy that deep love for um, all of humanity has to be front and center. That actually is infectious. When you love, um, you cannot lead a country you do not love. You cannot lead a country if you don't love the people inside the country, all people inside the country. You have to love everybody in it. Uh, We are not countries that were meant to be only one thing. It is supposed to be this beautiful diversity of people. And that makes the country magical. Um, It is supposed to. And instead, if we lead with love, we will find a country where everyone is welcome. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And when you see the hate creep in, then you've, then you've actually lost. It means that they've changed who you are because we're on this side. If you are someone who is committed to nonviolence, or if you are on the side of progress and social change, or or the way I describe it as freedom and dignity for all people, if you're on that side, it's because you weren't made (laughs) to hate. And if you start feeling that yourself, it's because they have now changed how you think. Yeah. Um, and so that is a, a daily practice of centering yourself and making sure that you're coming from the place that's authentic to you. Um, that unwavering love for, for people, people who are different than you, um, yeah. is so important and so critical. And I think what has become very clear in the past, say, five, seven years, and both in the U.S. and in India, is that 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 people being different from you is not about ethnic is not always about ethnicity or race or religion right. it can be about ideology yes and unfortunately um, uh, there is a kind of a culture which has inculcated the idea that to hate someone for their ideology is okay yeah it's only not okay to hate them hate them for the color of their skin or the okay. you know name of their religion or uh, you know, the language they speak. And, and but you know, in fact, there's no difference. You know, I wonder, I've never thought about this before, except when you were saying it. I wonder because we haven't healed the previous hate, the hate that was based on race and color of skin and religion and caste, because that type of hate hasn't been healed, it became easier to find more things to divide us on. Um, And maybe if we go back to some of the original pain and divisions, uh, it wouldn't allow us, if those have been properly healed, it wouldn't allow us to find new things 
to hate on. We'd have a, a little more roadmap of how to come yeah. together. I'm not sure. I was just thinking about that as, is actually this hatred on ideology just an extension of previous, um, of our historic problems? Maybe. It, that is a very real possibility. Uh, the only uh, uh, complication that I visualize there uh, is that, you know, we do also, at least in India, I know the US on the race issue may be different, uh, though there also, I think if we went looking, we may find some of these nuances. I suspect that what we had was a very complex mixture of the problem, both continuing and being healed at the same time. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if that was not there in the DNA of the society, you know, parents uh, like mine, and I know you mentioned that your father's family uh, survived the partition. Yes, my father, yeah. Right, and my parents also came out. I'm much older than you, but my entire clan was displaced by partition. And yet, uh, so I'm born 10 years after independence, right? And so I'm growing up in the 60s and 70s. Never, ever was partition presented to us as a story that required us to now cultivate hatred towards anyone. Right. On the contrary, the message, I mean, and it's not like it was being hidden from us. There were pretty graphic to tales being told, even when we were right. children. And I must tell you, I mean, as a child, many of those stories were very frightening. Right. I mean, they are still frightening, you know, yeah. when I'm past 60. But none of those stories carried the, you know, overt or covert message that we are now required to hate A or B or C because right. they did it to us. And I think that this quality of uh, large heartedness and of depth, I think it came from a depth of being, mm -hmm. which there was no, uh, you know, there was no confusion about what was an injustice or what was a trauma. That was very, right. no, if, if, if there was no denial. But there was a sense of, we are bigger than this. Right. And so we've and lost a little bit of that in this time. Something, something. And I don't know if it's technology or it is, you know, the political economy that has shaped up in the last 70 years. But maybe it is the atomization and the more intense alienation mm -hmm. that has made such large volumes of people yeah. vulnerable. I know, I'm sorry, we are when you're alienated. Time. It's true. You know, it's just making me think about this idea of belonging. No, go ahead, but say, say, finish what you were saying. Yeah, belonging is such an important human need that yes, if we don't belong yes. and we're isolated, then it's easy to yeah. use the strategy of divide and conquer. That is something that's been as old as time, yeah. that politicians in every country and everywhere and yeah. groups and tribes throughout the beginning of history, divide and conquer is such a tried and true strategy. And so if you are isolated, if you're not sure where you belong, if yeah. social media and everything else is telling you one thing, then it is very easy, I think, to to do the divide and conquer strategy. That would be a, another way to look at it because somebody gains when you- um, That's right. When That's you right. use that. Yeah. So that brings us back therefore to the importance of what you do. And thank you so much and God bless you for doing the work that you do. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for having me back and thank you for asking No, questions. thank you for making the time. I really, really appreciate it and all the best. Wishing you all yes. the best. Bye dear. Thanks. Bye. Keep in touch. Thank you all. Thank you for joining. And uh, we now close this session of Ahimsa Conversations live uh, with our friend Nisha Anand from the West Coast in the USA. Thank you and stay tuned for more such sessions.